Hello, everyone. Welcome to Coast to Coast. My name is Lillian Corral, and I'm joined by my co-host, Lily Whiteberg. Hi, Lily. Hi, Lillian. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's you know, and I know that you're dealing with this too um, in, in Southern California, but it's um, it's been a tough time with COVID and, yeah. and it's, you know, it's, it's getting really close and it's been, um, you know, it, it's, it's been really hard um, knowing people who are getting sick and, and then just everything is, is rapidly changing. And we were just talking about this earlier with our co-hosts too. Yeah, no, um, it's interesting. I was telling a friend last week where I feel like it's getting closer. Whereas I, yeah. I know in Southern California, we've been practicing a lot of shelter in place and keeping the numbers low. Now, especially because I work with so many colleagues in Florida, starting to hear about so many stories that are just a lot closer to home. Yeah. It's starting to, it, it feels a little bit closer than, um, than before. So it's definitely um, difficult times for everyone. We hope everyone is staying safe and using their masks. Yes. Um, I know I'm getting used to mine, um, and especially with my little, I'm <laughs> trying to get him to also use one too. Um, oh, so has he, has, does he use one or? Not very well. Oh, okay. my, my son is 18 months old, yes. so as you can imagine, is not very good right. at it. At least trying to introduce him to it, because also, yeah. like, just the experience of a child now all of a sudden seeing you, like, know. you know, we're not used to it. So um, it's just, uh, you know, getting him used to being in public yeah. people on masks is that. Uh, I know. Yeah. And there's this whole other thing that we could talk hours about, yeah. but there's also the issue of language, too, not being able to see your mouth moving and, yeah. you know, and, and that with, with children. So, um, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, it's definitely strange times. It's a dynamic time. Um, but I'm really happy that, that we continue to, to have these conversations um, yeah. about what we're seeing in cities and, and what we're learning, um, because it is, it is so dynamic. And that's really what Coast to Coast is about, is looking at the future of communities um, and, um, and really seeing and, and hearing from um, practitioners. Um, so we, we started looking at public spaces. Um, then we did a deep dive um, around equity and how we can think about that um, in our um, institutions, um, around public art and, and all of that. And, and equity actually wasn't, wasn't new, though. I mean, equity was a, was a component of everything that we were talking about, but we, we really did. We continued and went deeper. And then this last one that we did, I thought was super interesting around, um, around the, the digital public realm, the digital public square, and, and really thinking about that transition that, that's occurring and, and what does local mean? And um, so it's been super interesting. I'm excited about this conversation today on mobility. Yeah, yeah, great tea up there. Um, so mobility is a topic that has really come across a lot of these shows too. It's one of those where obviously it stands on its own, but it impacts um, a lot of the, it, it's been part of the conversation in terms of how we use our open streets, yeah. um, what, what equity and access. Um, so it, it's sort of come up a lot of times, but I'm really excited to talk today with Anthony Townsend and Warren Logan. So. Yeah. Anthony is um, a, an author, scholar around the work of smart cities and also automated vehicles, um, especially in the last um, couple of years. He's done some amazing work with, with the National League of Cities and now has a great book out, which we'll talk more about, called Ghost Road, Beyond the Driverless Car. And Warren Logan is the Director of Mobility Innovation in the uh, Mayor's Office um, in Oakland for Mayor Libby Schaaf. And Warren um, comes from the city of San Francisco, so has a long history in mobility. Can tell us a little bit more about what's happening in, in Oakland and in cities Super. in particular. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, just as we tee this up, I think what, what I really hope that we can really think about is one, how mobility is being impacted. I and mean, obviously it's been changing over the last couple of years. And when I mean mobility, obviously we think about it from both a public transit and a private perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a system that's been changing over the last couple of years. Now you have COVID, you have all these questions about race and equity and access yeah. and how our, our transportation systems have, have hindered a lot of equity um, yeah. and access for communities. And so, um, so I think there's a lot to talk about and we only have 30 minutes. Yeah. To okay. In. Well, good luck with that, and, and I'll be hopping in um, to get the Q&A. Um, so everyone, all audience members, please put your, your questions in the Q&A box, and I'll see you in, in 15 minutes. Perfect. Okay. Bye. Anthony and Warren, um, please join me. Thanks so much. Um, 
So I just sort of teed it up a little bit, right? At least from the night perspective, we think about mobility both from that equity lens, but also from the innovation space in terms of thinking about all the disruption. I'd love to just start with both of you and just ask you like, um, I love this exercise about a lens. Like what lens do you come to this conversation with? Um, so why does mobility matter to you? Can you just sort of talk about it from your various perspectives? Like why do you think this is such an important area of work? Sure, thank you Lillian for asking a really broad question that I think has so many implications. Um, the first I'll share from my transportation planning background is that mobility is about access to resources and COVID or otherwise, it's about getting to jobs, it's about getting to friends, to the grocery store, you know, taking your kids to school. And so when we think about the impact of a pandemic on that, that um, really important uh, you know, mobility factors, that's also, it's the same thing again, which is like, how are we getting to those same resources, but perhaps differently? And I think that from a digital sp perspective, that's also gonna be really important too. Mm -hmm. How do you yeah, from my from my point of view, I, I agree 100 percent. I mean, mobility is the lifeblood of cities, um, but it's also the area where I think the promise of technology uh, to improve cities and give people choices has been realized most clearly, um, you know, most widely and for the largest number of people. Um, you know, there were a lot of promises made about urban technology over the last decade, and this is one where I think you know a huge number of people now see the benefits in their pocket, um, and so it's touched a lot of lives and and given people a lot more choices and um, you know a lot more freedoms. So it's a great test case for understanding how technology might affect housing or education or or healthcare or other other areas of urban life in the future. That's a great point. Um, I definitely want to get back to that when we think about the future because I, I I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, so just thinking about the moment we're in, especially during this pandemic, um, is there something that like most strikes both of you about the trends in mobility that you've seen or some of the impacts that, that, that have occurred? Like what's been the most surprising thing for both of you? Sure, I'll, I'll go first. I, I mean this politely. I, I don't think I'm actually that surprised about anything that's happened during COVID when it comes to transportation, when it comes to mobility, when it comes to, to technology related to transportation. I think that, especially from a policy standpoint, and you know, just again being active in the Bay Area for over ten years now, you know, a lot of the trends that we're seeing in relation to people's you know lack of access to resources, as we just talked about, are the same um, demographic shifts that that have always been occurring. If you don't have a car, you're still going to lack access, right? If you're relying on bike share, you might get so far, but there's still not enough infrastructure to get you there safely. On the other hand, and this sounds perhaps more positively. I've been really encouraged by the fact that people are finally looking at the ways in which we use our rights of way, our streets, our sidewalks, um, our parks um, flexibly, and that we're now finally able to suspend some of our original preconceived notions around like cars first, everything second, and now having a thoughtful conversation about maybe people first and mobility is part of that, whether or not you use a different tool to um, get to your different resources. Well, and other, I don't know if you want to answer about that, but maybe circling back to that previous point you made about the, the potential, it seems to me like that flexibility was in some ways the, the, one of the potentials that technology was going to give us in terms of the way we could manage our cities. And it hasn't really happened. So, um, I mean, is, are there some, what are the things that are surprising you and, and how are you seeing some of these tech benefits realized if you could give us some examples? Yeah, I mean, the, the big surprise, which has both fascinated and kind of horrified me, has been around um, delivery and what we've seen the private sector, and particularly like the, the sort of venture-backed tech sector, um, do to, to step in and find a way to scale up, you know, the number of food and grocery deliveries by a factor of about three since January um, across the country. And to to you know make this not so awful for people that have had to isolate either as a precaution or isolate you know um, out of medical necessity, uh, and they've delivered medicines and educational materials and all kinds of other things that people need to maintain life at home, and that's been really remarkable. At the same time, it's been horrifying because you can see a lot of 
moves to position uh, to essentially, you know, take the whole Walmartification of, of Main Streets to a whole nother level. Um, Walmart, in fact, has been, you know, they took advantage of Amazon's missteps early on to try to move in and recapture some of the e-commerce pie. Amazon bought Zooks, which is an automated uh, software, comp automated driving company. People think that they may be making automated delivery play. And then Uber just, you know, bought Postmates last week to try to uh, continue their expansion of rebalancing their business to be about 50% passengers and 50% deliveries. And so as we see all these small businesses falling apart, you see these big, um, you know, players back with big pockets moving in to take, take over big parts of the local economy. And I don't think that's a good thing for, for cities over the long run. Anthony, it's funny that you should say that, though, just to kind of respond quickly, yeah. that yeah. I, I guess I have been surprised. I'm not surprised that we're seeing technology companies pushing way ahead in terms of the movement of goods, the movement of freight and things like that. I, I think that funny enough in my last role in San Francisco, I pushed a lot of the companies kind of hard on this policy space to say, why is it that you're climbing up this really steep hill to, to deliver people with so many different regulatory hurdles when delivering goods to people is actually much simpler, right? You know, because there's so many safety implications and so on. Interestingly enough, though, in you know, timing is everything. It's kind of unfortunate, actually, that we weren't able to launch something like a scooter program just before COVID. And the reason I share that is because just at the same time that people are not able to take transit because either transit services are, are you know, going to light uh, capacity or not even running at all, people are now more timid around you know, sharing group spaces. I think this would have been a really great opportunity to double down on those types of technologies. And unfortunately, we've seen just the opposite. You know, companies are pulling back on, on scooters. Many, in, in many cities, we're also not seeing bike share anymore. And this might have been the perfect time to have seen those types of services launch, not decrease or even completely, um, get, you know, go away. Do you have any thoughts on that? Any reaction? No, I mean, so it, I mean, I, I think it's an interesting point because what it says is, is like cities and and the companies that are making investments, right? Like they're all sort of taking taking measures to to try to deal with this in the short term, but there's some some long term steps that they could take together that maybe they were doing stuff before COVID that there was some long term alignment, right? After all the the struggles that cities have had with these tech companies kind of entering markets without permission and whatever. Um, but then COVID sort of threw that all up in the air again. And you had the scooter companies, you know, and the bike share companies pulling back and doing crazy things like, you know, uh, the jump bikes getting destroyed in the North Carolina forests, you know, in the dark of night. Um, like whatever long-term alignment was starting to happen seems to have just gotten thrown out the window as people have scrambled to adapt. So you know, maybe a reset in, in that conversation seems to be in order. And, and you know, as you point out, more, more sort of micro mobility is something that cities really need right now so that people can run down to their restaurants and pick up their orders or those restaurants can do their own delivery instead of relying on these big platforms, you know, 30% yeah. like of the cut. <laughs> And in some cities, I think we are seeing interesting partnerships. Like I know for us, we've noted like in Detroit in particular, they've partnered with both Jump and GM um, and have delivered a thousand e-scooters to essential workers who can use them to be able to get to work. So there are some of these partnerships in place. I definitely want to get to the whole um, you all forecasting what the future looks like in a minute. But I mean, this is a good jump to this point about the private sector and how much um, so maybe starting with you, Warren, I mean, um, how much or how is it to be uh, someone who works in mobility for a city and have so much of your work, this is my opinion, impacted in a lot of ways by the private sector? And like, what are the levers that you have of, uh, that you have or you've been using to kind of really mitigate some of these changes? I just made a lot of assumptions, so maybe clarify that. And then, Anthony, I'd love to get your take on like, yeah, how you're seeing industry really drive a lot of what's happening in the quote unquote marketplace or in, in our cities. Sure, I, I'm gonna unpack a little bit of that multi-pronged yeah. question. So the first is like, what it's like to work in a city 
you know, both during and, and before COVID in relationship to the private mobility space. And I think that both working in San Francisco and now in Oakland on this very issue, it's been kind of a night and day scenario in a way because our approach here in Oakland has been very open, very collaborative to understanding how these technology companies can, you know, provide just as we were just talking about, like the pieces of the puzzle that government and, you know, public agencies are not able to provide, whether that's, you know, bike sharing in downtown districts that, you know, have our transit lines only going in certain directions or, you know, providing even um, uh, gig car sharing around the city to help people make their quick errands and so on. So it's, it's been really reassuring in some ways during COVID to see many of these companies stepping up and providing the level of support that you've even mentioned during a time when we needed them the most. And I think that's in part where my excitement, but also a little bit of disappointment comes in with the private mobility space. And this is a polite criticism is that I spent about three years in this space in San Francisco, listening to a number of companies share with me just how essential their product was, that this was gonna be the game changer for transportation. And when it came time for those companies, those services, those widgets, right, to prove themselves, I think some really did exactly that in spades and others kind of recoiled. And I think that that's in part what's challenging about being in the government right now I think to Anthony's point especially, is that I don't want our residents relying on a service for, for resources that, that are so dire to them, right? Like getting to their jobs, getting to their daycare, getting food on the table. If those services are not going to be dependable in times of emergencies, and as we're entering COVID, we're now, you know, it's July, this started in February and March, I'm really concerned that we need to make sure that whatever is in the marketplace, whether it's public whether it's private, whether it's a partnership, that it's stable and will last into the future, no matter you know, what changes may occur or you know, blips in the road. Anthony, how do you see the industry driving this? I mean, I, I think there's a lot of uncertainty right now. Um, so you know, I've been thinking a lot about automated vehicles. And um, in China, we've seen a bunch of companies that have been working on automated vehicles pivot um, after the pandemic swept through there and start to try to apply those technologies to new solutions that would be relevant for the post COVID environment. So there was one company that had built a contact, a robot for contactless delivery of medicines inside COVID wards. Well, once, you know, once the pandemic was snuffed out in China, they didn't really need it. So they're now using it for contactless del delivery of food in restaurants. Um, and I think, you know, Silicon Valley had promised us self-driving cars. We're still waiting for that. Those things are, automated vehicles are coming. It's just not gonna look like what Larry Page or, or Elon Musk promised us. It's gonna come in a thousand different shapes and sizes, um, which is good for cities, but I think it's gonna require cities to, to do what Warren was talking about, which was to, to sort of be welcoming and allow these experiments to watch over them and regulate them and permit them in ways that are sensible and watch out for their citizens. But to, to be a little daring and a little tolerant of risks, particularly you know, uh, when it serves to meet some of these needs um, that are gonna become very acute during COVID. So um, I, think, you know, I think the technology, um, it, it's not clear if the money is gonna be there the way it's been there in the past. I mean, that is shaking itself out in the markets. It may not be a hundred billion dollars a year like it's been for the last couple of years, um, but I think that the needs will be much, much clearer about how we apply it. When Anthony, I'm glad that you, sorry, really, I didn't mean to get you off. Anthony, I'm glad that you mentioned those two words, right? Like risk and then the value, right? One of the interesting things about COVID is that I think everyone, and, and especially government, which can be really uh, hesitant, very safe, very you know, close to the vest, we've been such risk takers in this time because, and I don't mean this in a glib way, but it's like, what's the worst that could happen, right? Like, okay, close 10% of your streets, right? Like we're seeing cities take the kinds of risks that I think during these really critical times is, is important, but maybe not to take those types of risks all the time. And by extension, what is also important about COVID in light of these mobility shifts is that both during this time and then hopefully after all of this, 
we're, I think, going to have a much clearer perspective on where the gaps were, right? Like we've now confirmed who really needs the help, no matter a pandemic or otherwise, and what, where we really need to drive value. And frankly, where from a government perspective, where we really want to focus our attention, not so much, let's say, on, you know, the little trips to, you know, on scooters to go see your friends, but like, there's so much more value now to ensure that, just as you said, we're getting medicine to people in DP Stokeland, right? That we're able to use our rights of way for the types of trips that are gonna be so important to people connecting to resources as, as we move forward. And I think it's gonna be a long time before we really come back to a new normal. I wouldn't say back to normal, but just a new paradigm that feels stable and secure. Yeah. Well, I, I wanna to jump to this point and then I know we have questions in the queue um, with Lily. I mean, I think, one of my favorite uh, people in mobility, a woman, um, said recently in a conversation, you know, that, you know, haven't communities been saying these things for a long time? Like, do we have to go back to, so I appreciate the point, like now we're seeing these gaps, but it's almost kind of like the digital divide. It's like, we didn't really believe it, but now we like see it and it's impacting everyone. And now we are like, all, oh yeah, everybody needs access to the internet. So how about, like, where do communities fall into this? And especially, I think, on the autonomous vehicle um, discussion, Anthony Knight has an initiative that's really focused on, like, supporting cities and, and ensuring that there's a true engagement process that hopefully informs their own work and informs the industry um, as these pilots are rolling out. Because we, we didn't see that there was a lot of public engagement. We, 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 we haven't really, uh, maybe to your earlier point, right, Warren, like, you know, we think these services are really coming, they're critical, but we haven't really been engaging the people for whom these services are, are supposedly for or are critical to. So, um, so how do you all see the role of public engagement in this um, and then in, in this work and in this time? And how do we not go back to communities and ask the same thing about, you know, what are your mobility needs? Because in a lot of ways, we've, we've kind of known them and we've, right, I mean, They've been telling us for a long time right. what's wrong with our transportation systems, it seems like. One, and you know, perhaps I misspoke a little bit. It's not that these gaps are new. And I think that was what I shared at the beginning of this. I'm not surprised, right? Like if you're paying yeah. attention to the last, I want to say a hundred years or maybe 200 years of like American <laughs> history and its intersection with race and, you know, affected communities, like all of this is quite predictable, right? Like you could watch all of this happen and not really be surprised that black and brown communities are the most affected by COVID because they're disproportionately less, you know, available to public health, to public transportation, to all these other services that lots of other people have. So like, I'm going to, I'm going to park that here. In terms of engagement, I think that what we've learned, especially during this period of time, is that instead of this Marco Polo call and response where I have an idea and I'm now going to bring it to community and, and have them say yes or no, right? We're now talking about us going to the community on a consistent conversational basis and saying, how do we help? How do we keep this conversation going? And what that looks like for technology, and I, again, I'm, I'm remiss of just sharing this so many times with autonomous vehicle companies, including Zooks before they were owned by Amazon, that oftentimes people would, and by people I mean technology companies, would pitch us or engage government, engage community in what they believe the solution was to a problem that may or may not exist. And I think that that's the wrong type of engagement. I would have preferred those types of companies say, we have a technology, it can do all of these different things, and we're curious how it can help people. You share with us, what are your needs, and let's co-create a solution. Anthony, any, any words on that? And if not yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a big, it's kind of, kind of an academic question, but I think it's important that there's so much changing right now. You know, we've got huge numbers of people working from home. We've got a lot of speculation about people fleeing cities and moving to the suburbs. We've cut off a big chunk of international migration into the US, which is driving a lot of the <clears throat> growth of cities for the last couple decades. Um, you know, we have uh, unemployment, keeping people at home or potentially sending people out in the So we've got so much changing in daily travel patterns and we know very, very little about it. Um, and I, I think 
we have this amazing apparatus, which is the mobile phone network that tells us basically where everybody is all the time. There's a tremendous amount of privacy concerns in tapping that to figure out how mobility patterns are changing. But I think because mobility is changing so fast and our ability to fund particularly the public transport piece of it is gonna be so thin going forward, the public health implications of public transit are gonna be so complicated. I think we may need to start exploring ways to look a little more deeply, a little more closely into that mobile phone trace data to understand you know, where people are going and when they're going so that we can serve them better and really understand how mobility is changing and whether it's changing over the long term or not. Because it's very likely that we may end up running the few buses we have to places that people aren't actually going and not using that resource wisely. Um, yeah. yeah, lots of thoughts on that. Lily, what are the kinds of, I know we've got some questions in the sure. queue. Yeah, and this is a great conversation, and um, and and um, that Anthony, that that's that's very powerful. And, and Warren, I'm sure that you're you're thinking about this every day. You're living and breathing this um, around public transit, um, and so that there a, a few a few questions um, clustered around that um, around around the safety piece, how there's less demand, um, and and how how are cities possibly going to fund um, public transit? Um, um, but I do want to dig into um, a, a question around micro mobility, um, and um, and this is from um, a, a a person who is a big Warren Logan fan. So Warren, this is, this is a part of your fan club, um, and um, and she asked, um, could cities work with the private companies to ensure sustainability, reliability, affordability, and equity? What what are your? I, I want to hear from each of you. Um, what do you think about that? Absolutely. And I think that, sorry, someone's calling at the same time. Um, I think we can. And I, in mm -hmm. fact, I know we can. We've seen a number of times these critical partnerships. And I want to share, though, that I think a lot of the lack of success, the lack of progress in that space, probably has mostly to do with the government. I, you mm -hmm. know, I've been in a lot of spaces around the Bay Area, around the country, mm -hmm. um, and other countries, actually, that start with a conversation of whether or not we even want to participate in the conversation. Yeah. And that's really challenging. Like if you wanna have a collaborative you know, front door, I think you have to A, have a door that's clear and B, open that door. You can't create this sort of wall around, <laughs> wall around your city or around your city government. I, I really think that, it's, that there's an onus on us to actively participate in the conversation and to try and learn what these technologies are capable of and, and to stress test them with the companies. You know, mm -hmm. I've been so um, happy to have shared a lot of really difficult conversations at times with engineers, with planners in these companies where I'm like, I don't think that's going to work. Tell me how this happens. Tell me how you meet this need to really stress test, you know, um, delivery robots, for example, right? Like, how do you meet ADA concerns? Okay, like, let's keep iterating on that. But when we don't participate in that conversation, then I don't think we should also be surprised when technology companies miss the mark. Because mm -hmm. if we don't tell them, right, if we don't share the expertise that we're so you know, thoughtful in understanding, then like, that's not a fair debate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and that's powerful that you said. You know that 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 you're you're from city government, and you're saying that that you guys sometimes miss the mark. So, um, Anthony, any thoughts? You're muted. Sorry, I was answering some questions in the in the chat window. Oh, sure. <laughs> any specifically that you want to? Do you have any thoughts on that? And if you want to, if you want to touch upon um, one that really stands out to you. Yeah, I was just answering the question about drones. Uh, someone had asked if um, drones were going to be a part of this mix, and uh, I said yes. Um, there's a lot of opposition to drones over, of course, nuisance and noise and safety. Um, uh, and it's probably going to be some time before we see a lot of drones in cities. Uh, but there's some very interesting work that's come out of Carnegie Mellon in the last couple of years showing that under certain setups, the drones may actually be the, the most carbon efficient way to move cargo over the last mile because it's mm -hmm. basically just all you're moving is the motor. Um, and it's just like a motor attached to a box flying down the street, um, which would be what really interesting. Oh, sorry. Um, 
one, Anthony, I'm gonna I'm gonna probe that for a second, which is kind of the game I play with all the other technologists <laughs> in the Bay Area. Is like, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? Mm. Well, in that case, it's moving goods uh, over the last mile. Yeah. So, comparing it to moving it by truck, or I think it's the most carbon efficient motorized means. Um, so yeah, if you're comparing it to a cargo bike, I don't think it, I don't think it competes, but I have to go back to the study. But. And why are you pressing on that, Warren? Like, why, why are well, you? Well, because I think th this is just the type of conversation I've had a number mm -hmm. of times where people will start with a technology and like in search of yeah. a problem, like can drones help cities? And it's like, okay, yeah. well, what is the problem that cities are struggling with? And then how have we tried to resolve them? What are our guiding principles? And then what is the technology yeah. that can be applied? Yeah. So I think Anthony, just to kind of go back to what you're st stating and this sort of an example that for your listeners out there is implicit in that question is an understanding perhaps of like goods movement and, and where the challenges are. And so what I heard you say, Anthony, was that we have both uh, an inefficiency in terms of like sustainability or, in, or environmental challenges, right? Like that our existing model for moving goods is not good for the environment. That's, that's like issue one. The second is, I think, as I've heard from, from other drone specialists, is that goods movement is also affecting, um, affecting congestion in cities. And so you have to start thinking, okay, well, like why are people stuck in congestion? And if one third of the congestion, for example, is because of UPS and FedEx and everything else, then, then let's work on that. But I think that there are other steps before that that kind of mm -hmm. make you wonder like, well, why is it that people are ordering so much online, right? Like mm -hmm. that, that's a completely different path to take down and, or to go down, excuse me. And you might find that that question is actually a land use question and has nothing to do with transportation, right? Like mm -hmm. I order things to my house because there's no grocery store near here. So should I invest billions of dollars in drone technology or can we partner to just stick a, you know, better grocery store nearby that people can walk to, right? And like, even though those things are very far apart, if you go back to the understanding of like what the problem is that we're trying to solve for, you might find that there are other paths we could have taken and perhaps even better money could be spent. Mm. Fair. Um, and I think that that's, that's a, that's a really important um, question to always ask. Um, Anthony, do you have a, do you have any um, a response to that? Yeah, no, I think it, it's, it's an industrial solution to the problem, which is, you know, Amazon doesn't want to wait. Their customers want what they want now. So they're mm -hmm. trying to solve the problem of how do I deliver 50,000 boxes in this zip code within 15 minutes of a customer asking for it the getting things off the street and reducing the carbon footprint is sort of potentially a bonus, you know, for the public um, in, in, the, in that world. I think the more, the more interesting use of drones is actually for collecting data about urban conditions, mm -hmm. you know, uh, heat loss from buildings, movement of vehicles, mm -hmm. um, you know, potentially assisting during evacuations, um, you know, monitoring construction activity, all kinds of stuff like that. We're seeing drones so basically drop providing the same kind of like surveillance of the city that they provide in the battlefield, but doing mm -hmm. it to support government operations yeah. um, in the public interest. Um, you know, I, I wrote quite a bit about this in Ghost Road, so if you want to check that out. Fantastic. And we just linked to that um, in the, the chat box, um, Anthony's, Anthony's latest cool. book. Um, but, um, but yes, I mean, it's, it, it, and certainly drones are, are, are having a, are playing a role um, in, during the COVID-19 with dropping off prescriptions and, and all that. So I'm going to call back Lillian um, to, to close this out. We, we have gone over time. Sorry to our audience, but it's been a really good discussion. Um, and, uh, and Lillian, please. Yeah, well, we always have to close it out with just an opportunity for both of you to kind of just say, and, and, and we didn't never got to the prediction part of the show, so I guess maybe we'll do this, which is, <laughs> I mean, how do you, uh, there's a lot of speculation, right? And it is all just speculation, because I think um, we don't know yet how COVID or anything 
frankly, 2020, <laughs> how 2020 is going to end. Let's just call it that. So, um, Anthony and uh, Warren, do you have, can you take a little bit about, I mean, what are some plausible scenarios you're seeing for the space that, you, that you're moving in? Anthony, you with more automated vehicles and mobility, and Warren, you with cities and, and, and a lot of these sort of transportation partnerships and things like that. Sure, it, and I'll, I'll add the like what I'm hopeful for to that end too, which is I, I think a best case scenario for how we end 2020 is people really feeling confident that our streets are safe for everyone and secure for everyone. And, and, I, and I'm speaking quite deliberately about racial justice as well, and that we are able to now have a concrete, understandable conversation with our neighbors about all of the different challenges we're having and how technology can help with that and how, and I saw this in some of the questions, how even distant face-to-face -face conversations can really help us both heal some of our institutional challenges that we keep sort of ignoring while also moving forward towards a more realistic and sustainable way for using streets and sidewalks and, and, and public space. And Anthony, how do we end 2020? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we need um, a really, kind of comprehensive widespread campaign to get people riding public transit again uh, and, and dealing rationally with the risks of doing so. Um, you know, I've been doing it just to see what the transit agencies are doing in terms of precautions and how safe it is and how people are behaving. And, you know, frankly, I find it's, it's one of the safest, most well-behaved spaces I feel safer riding public transit than I do at the beach right now in terms of how people are respecting, you know, the social space. Um, and I think we're going to need to do that to keep, to keep these systems alive and have some continuity and build public support for all the subsidies that transit's going to need. Um, that bridge, you know, between now and, and whatever's after, I think is really, really important. And having, you know, bodies in there uh, and bodies of people who are influential um, is going to be really important. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for some celebrities to step out and say, you know, I got on the bus, I got on the train today because it's safe, you know, and we know the evidence from other countries is that it is safe. So. That's a great point. Um, well, thank you both. This has been a really amazing conversation. I know it's just the beginning of the discussion. So for the people who are, um, for our guests who are listening in on um, our audience, um, uh, make sure to check out both Anthony and Warren on Twitter. Um, Anthony is at Anthony Mobile um, and Warren, you are at Warren Mobility. So um, both very similar. And then also, if you have a chance, check out the links in the chat we've been posting. There's some great resources there around the work of both of these men. Thank you very much. Lily, do you want to say anything about next week's show? And, sure, um, sure. Yeah, and thank you. Thanks, Lillian. And thank you, Anthony and Warren. Um, so next week, um, we have Walter Hood. Um, who's going to be joining us and he'll be um, looking at the future of public spaces, landscape, the public realm, and, and what that looks like at the intersection of race and equity. Um, and so it should be a really interesting conversation. I'm excited to have him. And of course, Walter is a Knight Public Spaces Fellow and a MacArthur Fellow. So, um, so it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Great. Well, thank same you. Same place, everyone. same time. Yes. Thanks. Bye.